um, March 22, 2024. Uh, appreciate the indulgence for a bit of delay this morning while we got everything organized. I want to start the committee before we go to bills by just thanking our staff who've been working really hard over the last week, Hannah Grewald Noldner and Olivia Siverson. Appreciate your work. Um, also, Amanda Peterson and Linnea, the researchers. So appreciate your work. Um, Senate file 4909, Senator McEwen. Welcome to the committee, Senator McEwen. Senate file 4909 is in front of the committee, and I think you have an author's amendment, the A2. I do. Yes, Mr. Chair, I do have an A2 amendment, and that I would just say briefly that the A2 amendment reflects discussions that we have had with various stakeholders and some little changes that we've made to the content of the bill. Uh, and members, we have senators attending uh, virtually online. Senator Rest is present, and she offers the A2 as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A2 is adopted to your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And just briefly, I... Um, I don't know if the committee wants to address this or not because I feel like it could be taken care of in other ways, but I have an oral amendment if the committee would entertain it real quickly. Um, it's a clerical error that we made uh, on page four of line 4.10. We would delete using at least 48 point sans serif type font should I keep talking? Do you want me to wait? Are you writing? <laughs> yeah. I also have it written down, too. I could just give it to you. Would that be better? No. Well, it's... It Can the pages grab the amendment? Has lots of words like displayed, separate, disclosures. <laughs> it might be just easier for you to look at. It is... I'll just read it. And insert displayed on a separate from other disclosures and information in bold face sans serif font in a size in line with other text displayed. So it's a little bit long, but it, I would like to submit that as an oral amendment um, just to make sure it's very clean and reflects the latest discussion that we had had. When ready, Ms. Siverson, the oral amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Senator McEwen offers an oral amendment to the A2DE for SF4909, page four, line 10, delete, using at least 48 point sans serif, serif type font and insert displayed on a separate from other disclosures and information in bold face sans serif font in a size in line with other text displayed. Member questions or comments on the A or on the oral amendment? Senator Seeberger offers the oral amendment just uh, announced by council. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Oral amendment is adopted. Aye. To your bill. Aye. Could have been automated, it was. And you're, you know, helping people. Senator Rest, you're on microphone. Through that, that's in kind of a guided way. Is it good? Okay. Senator McEwen, to your bill. After, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity today to be able to present to you Senate File 4909 as amended. Um, this issue, the issue that this bill addresses was brought to me by a former constituent and friend, Dr. Shannon May, whose family and uh, her family's lives were turned upside down when they lost approximately $80,000 to a scammer posing as the Carleton County Sheriff's Office chief deputy. This scammer used a virtual currency kiosk in an elaborate scheme to defraud them. Uh, her full story and her testimony about what happened to her is in your packets. And if you have a time to take a look at it, she goes into a lot more detail about what happened to her and how it all played out. But it was, needless to say, uh, had a huge impact on their family finances and their sense of security. Um, 
this bill uh, that we have worked on, uh, which really comes out of our consultation then over recent months with the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Commerce, as well as stakeholders uh, from the industry uh, that, um, that has these currency kiosks, it puts in some common sense consumer protections and disclosures surrounding these virtual currency kiosks. This is new monetary technology that a lot of people don't understand. But with these new great technologies that help a lot of people, um, they also pose some dangers and we have to ensure that correct protections are in place. Local police departments are reporting that scams like this have increased in frequency and complexity. And because it is virtual currency, there's often little to no way to recover lost damages. Uh, we have, as I noted, and will continue to work with industry groups, including Rocket Coin and Coin Flip, to craft this critical legislation. And we're open to continued edits as we move forward, uh, and, and further work down the line as well. And uh, just as a note, I am working on this bill with legislators of both parties in the other body as well. As a quick overview, this bill will establish a new user daily transaction limit of $2,000 to limit potential losses. It will require clear and conspicuous disclosures before transactions, and it will implement required information on receipts including fees charged and information to contact the operator. Additionally, it will establish a 48-hour hold on first transactions with an operator and in that time frame allow the customer to cancel their transaction. So um, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, members, um, that concludes my, my uh, presentation of the bill, but I'll stand for any questions and I, ha I could do a more detailed walk through if you'd like, um, but the bill truly does reflect collaboration uh, between my office and a number of stakeholders and we, we believe that we have landed on some good compromise legislation here that's a really good first step in regard to protecting Minnesota consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. We have two listed testifiers, Mr. Zach Eichton and Mr. Larry Lipka. If present, you can both come up. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Eichton. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Klein and members of the committee. My name is Zach Eichton. I am a uh, lobbyist with Taft Advisors on, uh, here on behalf of our client Rocketcoin, which is a virtual currency kiosk operator here in Minnesota. Uh, and we just wanted to come to the committee and say thank you to uh, you and your staff, as well as uh, Senator McEwen and her staff, for working really collaboratively on this legislation. Uh, over the last eight years, uh, my client has developed effective consumer protections uh, and has valuable industry perspective that it looks forward to continuing to share collaboratively with the committee and authors to strengthen uh, the consumer protections that you're looking for here in Minnesota. Uh, we stand in agreement with our fellow kiosk operators on Chair McEwen's direction of the bill uh, to make sure that robust consumer protections are in place for customers here in Minnesota. And we're excited to be able to work in concert uh, with the legislature to make that happen. We really appreciate the direction the bill is going. Uh, and while we have some suggestions around the edges to make the bill stronger, uh, the partnership that Chair McEwen and her staff have shown on this bill to make it really, uh, really well crafted uh, is, uh, we just really appreciate all the work she's done on this. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to testify and we look forward to supporting this bill this session. Thank you, Mr. Eichton. Mr. Lipka, please introduce yourself and go ahead. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and honorable members of the committee. My name is Larry Lipka, General Counsel for CoinFlip. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I would also like to thank Senator McEwen for giving us the opportunity to discuss this bill with her and her staff. I think we're making really good progress uh, on the bill. Um, uh, we support smart regulation that protects consumers and keeps bad actors out of Minnesota. As such, we appreciate the opportunity to offer consumer protection-focused recommendations that we know to be highly effective in preventing fraudulent transactions at crypto kiosks. Our recommendations come from our experience as the largest kiosk operator in the U.S. and, in fact, in the world. Although digital currency, blockchain technology, and kiosks are new, the fraud we see reported is all too familiar and is a problem for all financial services products. It is more important than ever that we do not simply treat the symptoms, but attack the root causes of financial fraud by arming consumers with the knowledge they need to stay safe. We look forward to working with members of this committee and the state legislature. Again, thank you to Senator McEwen for your work on this important issue. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Mr. Lipka. Member questions, comments, or amendments? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a, a question either for the bill author or the testifiers on this uh, new customer hold. Um, and I was wondering if, if you could just explain how it would work. If I'm a new customer coming to this kiosk, what would my experience be like if I wanted that transaction to go through or perhaps I want to reverse the transaction during that 48-hour period? Senator McKeon. Thank you. Um, and this is one of the uh, parts of the bill that we've had some of the most recent discussion about. And I think a lot of it comes out of the experience that my uh, constituent and friend up in Duluth had had where um, it, there was a sort of feeling if I had just had a couple of days <laughs> um, to realize what uh, was going on, I think I, I might have started to put the pieces together that this wasn't legit. Um, but that first, the, the, a lot of these frauds rely on a sense of urgency that people have and a sort of sense of emergency so they engage in the, a transaction. So we wanted to create a period, uh, so we're, we're looking at 48 hours right now, that's what this reflects, where a first time user, uh, so this is just somebody who's never used one of these kiosks before, they would have a transaction limit and there would also be a 48 hour period before the transaction would actually complete, whereby if if they somehow found out that something wasn't quite right or they went in and they wanted to undo what they had done, um, that they could do that. That's the intent of it. And we are still discussing the sort of some of the logistics about how that might actually work. We might have some edits as we move forward, but that's really the intention. And perhaps um, um, our experts here might have something to offer as well. Yeah, I would just like to say, um, Senator McEwen and I were, were speaking, uh, sorry, may I speak? Mr. Lipka. Um, Senator McEwen and I were discussing this issue be before the hearing, and we would like to set up some parameters where somebody who wants a refund has to submit some sort of paperwork, their ID, and also the way that we would repay them, because there's not a way to refund them at the kiosk. So when somebody goes up to the kiosk, they insert cash into them. They, they choose how much crypto they want to buy. They insert the right amount of money. They scan their digital wallet, and ordinarily that cryptocurrency is sent to the digital wallet they gave to us immediately. So this is a little bit of a change to how our business works because people use our machines because they want to get their cryptocurrency immediately, whether that's because they, you know, are, they want to do some day trading or they want to make a purchase with their cryptocurrency or they need it for some reason. So we're hoping to suggest some, some changes and the Senator is willing to work with us to make this work for the industry. You know, we want to protect consumers and we understand that first time customers are the most vulnerable. So we're looking to protect those individuals while still allowing customers who have been using our machines for, you know, potentially years are able to buy the cryptocurrency in the amount that they want and mm -hmm. get it immediately. Yeah. Sir Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the bill author continuing to work on this piece. And one of the kind of you know, questions I would have as you continue to think about this 48-hour hold is if you have a consumer coming in, let's say with $100 and they're trying to buy a particular cryptocurrency, there's an exchange rate between, you know, the uh, dollars and that cryptocurrency, and that exchange rate can and probably will change over a 48-hour period, and so are they locking in a certain price? Who's kind of the custodian of that asset in the interim period? Um, I just think there's some complexities there. And especially with the transaction limit, um, you know, if, if you did have an individual who's experiencing fraud, at least you would be limiting their potential losses with that piece. Um, and so I would just recommend thinking about some of the, and I think you guys are thinking about some of the nuances there, and maybe having that transaction limit is enough protection. I know we'd, we always would like to have more protections, uh, but I just worry about some of the complexities, especially with... Uh, cryptocurrency can oftentimes be very speculative, and, and, the, and the price could change a lot over 48 hours, and the impact that that could have on a consumer's financial position, uh, especially if they're buying it for the first time. Yeah, if I may, uh, Mr. Lipka. Thank you. So one idea we had was requiring that someone provide a police report to indicate that they've been scammed, not that it's just buyer's remorse, that I, you know, that the price of Bitcoin has gone down, I no longer want it, I want a refund. So we're working with the senator on that to ensure that there are some parameters so that this isn't just buyer's remorse, that we're truly refunding victims of scams. And I think a police report is one small step in the right direction to ensure that this isn't just buyer's remorse. 
Members, the intent is to lay this bill over. It is going to show up later this morning uh, in our omnibus bill, and there will be two issues to be addressed. One is the oral amendment that was added on, and the other is this ongoing discussion about the 48-hour waiting period. I want to commit to the committee that uh, we'll be receptive to fixes, and the author has been working with us uh, on conference committee uh, repairs to that. Other member questions or comments? Members online? Senator McEwen, any closing comments? I just want to thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee for considering this bill. Uh, I'm really, really glad we've been able to do this work this year. Senate File 4909, as amended, is laid over. Senator Port. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Port, welcome to the committee. Uh, we're taking Senate File 3537 from the table, uh, and you have an amendment, which I don't think will be an author's amendment, um, to your bill and the amendment. Senator Thank Port. you, uh, Mr. Chair. I do have an amendment. Um, it's the A11, and I actually have an oral amendment that I'm hoping we can incorporate into that amendment. So let's get the amendment before us. Senator Wickland offers the A11 amendment uh, to Senate File 3537. Uh, Senator Port, the oral amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On line 2.8, after preferences, insert comma or. Council will report the oral amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This will be amending. Senate file 3537, as amended by the A11. Page two, line eight, after preferences, insert comma or. Uh, Senator Rasmussen. I'll move the oral amendment, Mr. Chair. Senator Rasmussen moves the oral amendment to the underlying amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the oral amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Oral amendment is adopted. We now have the A11 in front of us, proposed by Senator Wickland. Um, to the amendment, Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate you allowing me to come back and present some changes to the junk fees bill after having more time with stakeholders. I want to thank all the folks I was able to meet with to work on this bill, uh, to make this bill work here in Minnesota. In the week since I last was here, I met with or received language from the auto dealers, the Bankers Association, Cellular Telephone Industries Association, the Chamber of Commerce, Delta, Digital Restaurant Association, DoorDash, eBay, Hospitality Minnesota, Instacart, MSP Small Business Concessions Alliance, NFIB Small Businesses, Realtors, Retailers, and TechNet. We made changes to address specific concerns around businesses who are regulated by existing laws, how systems and tech work in various industries, small business intricacies, and clarifying tax language. This DE represents the product of that work, and I want to thank each of the organizations that worked with me on the bill. Uh, members, if you look at lines 1.7 and 1.8, this is clarifying language from Tax Council, um, which helped us uh, clarify that really the measure that we wanted to put in trying to define taxes or fees, uh, that they both are defined under tax law, and it really is specifying that the point of sale is uh, the triggering aspect to make sure that it's covered in this bill, so I appreciate tax council's help with that. Um, line 1.9 and 1.20 uh, was language that we worked with the auto dealers on. In the paragraph on 1.22 to 1.25, we removed the acknowledgement requirement um, that would have required businesses to really rebuild their websites. Um, in 2.7 to 2.10, this was really clarifying language that worked for a lot of small businesses, um, as we were talking to a gentleman who's a tree trimmer, uh, and his price really depends on how far he has to go and um, like the size of the tree that he's taking down. Um, and so we wanted to give options to clarify that when it's difficult to list the actual price. And the final uh, change was in 2.18 to 2.20, which we worked with the realtors on. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Port. And uh, your hard work is reflected in the fact that we have a very small list of testifiers today. Um, uh, let's adopt the amendment before we go to testifiers. Uh, having understood any questions or further member comments on the A11, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A11 is adopted. Ms. Jill Sims and Mr. John Reynolds, please come forward. Welcome back to the committee, Ms. Sims. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members. My name is Jill Sims. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Hospitality Minnesota. Um, we just want to put out a huge thank you to Senator Port for her willingness uh, to continually meet with us and work with us on the language. Um, there were two things we wanted to address today. It was One was the effective date, and we saw the A11 reflecting that 2025 implementation, which will be really helpful for our um, small businesses, so thank you. Uh, and the second is uh, around fees, government fees. I know Senator Port just addressed some of this. Um, our initial ask on 1.17 was to include or fees. I know um, there's been discussion that Senate... Uh, or the tax council has indicated that that is covered. So we would just ask that um, there's Department of Revenue guidance for our businesses so that they know that retail delivery fee, tourism improvement district fees are included in the tax. So again, our, our ask would just be that uh, there's Department of Revenue guidance. And that's it, really simple today, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Mr. Reynolds, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Klein. John Reynolds, the State Director for the National Federation of Independent Business. Uh, I want to echo Jill's comments and thank Senator Port for her willingness to meet and uh, work through our issues, uh, any concerns with the bill. Um, and uh, same, we, uh, well, we really appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate the clarification about the meaning of taxes on line 1.17, and uh, we appreciate the inclusion of the language in paragraphs G, H, and I, in particular, G, lead G for our members who are small service providers who try to do the right thing both for their customers and their businesses or their prospective cu customers and the business by providing uh, as much pricing information as they possibly can uh, up to the point at which uh, uh, the final charge becomes very customer specific. So this language in paragraph G is important for protecting them and their ability to communicate um, informational pricing information to their customers. So thank you, Senator Port, and thank you, members. Member questions, comments, or amendments on Senate File 3537. The question is on the motion of Senator Seeberger that Senate File 3537 is amended, be recommended to pass, and referred to the Senate um, floor, the sent to the Senate floor. Bills. Senator Rest, did you have discussion? Um, I gleaned a number of good ones from uh, March presentation. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Review process. Bill is on its way to the Senate floor. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Port, uh, Senate file 4782. Good morning, Senator Klein and members. It's my honor to be here today to present Senate file 4782, the first ever Office of Cannabis Management Agency bill. If you recall, last year we did historic work to start correcting the harms and failures of prohibition. Throughout the session last year, the bill was heard in 14 committees, took 65 amendments, and became one of the strongest cannabis laws in the nation. As I said many times last year, it won't be the last time the legislature hears a cannabis bill. Prohibition of alcohol ended over 100 years ago, and we still have a liquor bill nearly every year. The newly legalized and regulated industry is in its infancy and we are here to continue the work that we started last year. In partnership with a brand new Office of Cannabis Management, this bill improves and streamlines the licensing process and supply chain. It strengthens our social equity goals, accelerates the transition of enforcement infrastructure and resources, and it expands protections for medical patients. The OCM has done significant community engagement, worked with other regulatory bodies from states that have already gone through this process, and gotten input from regulatory industry experts. However, because we received this language fairly late in the season, as an author, I have not yet met with all of the stakeholders who have reached out. As evidenced by the 3,325 minutes spent in cannabis-related conversations last session, I deeply value the input of all who care about the process of implementation. 
As the Commerce Committee has jurisdiction of this agency, I appreciate Chair Klein's willingness to work with me on this. The plan for today is to have the agency walk through the bill to start the conversation with some testimony. As we work through the next seven committee stops, I will make space to hear from stakeholders and members who want to discuss adjustments. At the end of that work, we will bring the bill back here for a walkthrough of all the changes and final markup in this committee that has jurisdiction before passing it to the floor. I would now like to turn it over to Interim Director Charlene Briner to walk through the recommendations of the bill. And just to, for members to repeat what Senator Port just described, the process for this bill is that we will hear it today and pass it to agriculture. It has seven other stops. But before uh, it would go to the floor, it will come back to this committee for our review. Uh, Ms. Briner, uh, or Commissioner Briner, uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and members. It is a pleasure to be in front of you again uh, to speak about the Office of Cannabis Management's first bill. For the record, my name is Charlene Briner, and I am serving as the Interim Director of the Office of Cannabis Management. And I do want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to join Senator Port and for Senator Port's willingness to carry the agency bill on our behalf. The goal of our legislative recommendations are to strengthen the underlying foundations of Chapter 342 and to build upon the intent of last year's legislation that was developed by legislators and advocates, some of who are in this room today. We have multiple goals as we talk about the package that we're uh, bringing to you today. First and foremost, you've heard me talk previously about the two lenses we use, which are reflected in our first goals. First, it's to strengthen our work to ensure a timely and successful market launch. And second, we're dedicated to creating a regulatory framework that will allow us to effectively regulate the industry over the long term. Additionally, we want to prior prioritize public health and safety, strengthen the robust social equity provisions that are foundational to Minnesota's law, and expand protections for medical cannabis patients and their caregivers and continue to ensure con continued access for patients. And finally, we take seriously the charge to learn from other states, both what has worked and what is not. And we want to incorporate that learning, particularly as it relates to the legal challenges that have adversely affected market launch in other states. To inform these recommendations, and given the complicated nature of this industry and the many lessons that we have learned from other states, this package represents our best thinking about the, way, the best way to meet our shared goals for a Minnesota market and to, create, and to ensure a timely launch with effective regulation. We're also acutely aware of the urgency with, with which people expect us to act. And we believe that this package matches the speed with which that, those expectations are held and also recognizes that while urgency and timeliness is important, so is prioritizing doing this right in addition, to do it, in addition to doing it quickly. There are seven large buckets uh, that break down the sum of the recommendations. You'll see them in the presentation materials in front of you. And I'm going to walk through those broader buckets with each of you in a little bit more detail this morning. So let's start with the package or the set of proposals that are designed to improve the application and licensing process. Both a OCM and our local government partners are critical to a successful application process. Our bill includes several proposals to expedite and streamline the licensing process and the way applicants will interact with OCM and local governments. It also provides a reduction in early financial risk to all applicants, but most particularly to social equity applicants by removing the requirement for premises to be secured at the initial point of application. This change is a direct reflection of the feedback that we've gotten from potential operators, and we believe that by clarifying the order of operations for the application process, we'll make it easier for applicants to understand how to interact with the office, it will give informed information as a result of OCM's initial due diligence, and it will prevent bottlenecks and delays that could occur further in the licensing process. 
Additionally, our proposal establishes the authority for OCM to revoke a cannabis license if the business has not made a good faith effort to obtain an endorsement and open their doors. The last thing we want are licenses that have been issued and are then unused. And so the due diligence we do on the front end hopefully will mitigate that, but also having the authority to revoke an unused license will ensure that we can continue to make licenses available to uh, credible applicants. Our second set of proposals uh, is asking to streamline the cannabis supply chain. We recommend a consolidation of the currently separated medical and adult use cannabis supply chains into one single supply, chi supply chain. This comes very directly from the lessons we've learned about other states about how to create the conditions for market success in both medical and adult, in adult use cannabis sales. The fact of the matter is that cannabis is cannabis at the point of cultivation. And is cannabis is cannabis at the point of cultivation, and it is not distinctly different until the point of manufacture. The first place in the supply chain where we see that distinction is when manufacturers produce certain specific or specialty products for patients, things like oral solutions and capsules that are not available in a traditional adult use market. By removing that distinction at the point of cultivation, we're able to reduce administrative burdens that make it difficult for us to regulate and maintain the ratios that exist in Chapter 342. And it also helps us uh, ensure affordable retail prices for adult use consumers and medical patients. Additionally, because we streamline and strike the medical retail license, we substitute it with a new medical retail, license endo uh, retail endorsement for license holders. This creates additional opportunity for access points to medical retail sales while pre preserving the existing benefits for medical cannabis patients, including the tax exemption and the patient, patient consultation that are in 342. Next, and I think it's important to spend a little bit of additional time on strengthening the social equity provisions, which are already robust and very clear in the intention of Chapter 342. We believe, and we have heard from advocates, from stakeholders, and from many of you that we've had conversation with about the process of bringing this law into reality, that Chapter 342 is intended to support people who have historically lacked capital and political influence and access to traditional levels of power. To help us maximize our ability to meet that legislative intent, we propose a licensing selection process that utilizes the specific merit-based application components in Chapter 342 to vet entrance into a lottery. In an industry where there will always be more qualified applicants than there are licenses available, a well-vetted lottery process that contains significant due diligence on the part of OCM before entrance into the lottery will give people who have historically been excluded an opportunity into the market and, a, and an equal opportunity to those who are capitalized and well-capitalized and politically savvy. I want to be very clear about this point because people have big feelings about the lottery. OCM will use the current law as the parameters for vetting applicants even prior to entering that lottery. Additionally, I think it's important to note that there is no data that we have found that suggests that one type of business is more likely to be successful in the industry than another. I often use the example of two ends of the spectrum. One, a successful operator who has, who has been in another state and been successful in their operations with traditional bus business models and capitalization. And the second, who's been incredibly successful in a pre-legal market, but has also found success. What we are trying to do is entice and incent people to enter the legal market in order to tamp down illegal sales and the illicit market. And so we know that each of these applicants could be successful with creative business models. However, a subjective scoring system will likely favor, favor the former type of applicant. And we believe that this subjective implicit bias could unduly lead to inequitable outcomes in Minnesota's market. 
And so, in addition to that lottery, we also create a social equity license class classification that maintains that distinction of a social equity status after the application period, which is important as we think about the additional grant opportunities for social equity applicants, and it also ensures value in the license type. A few additional changes that we make are to improve flexibility in ownership and financial opportunities. Right now, Chapter 342 requires 100% ownership or controlling interest by a social equity applicant. We propose bringing this down to 65% to allow for opportunities for creative partnerships and access to capital in an industry in which it's incredibly hard to secure it because traditional methods of financing are not available. This also opens the door for those uh, partnerships to pursue capital and financial deals while also protecting the high threshold of ownership originally envisioned in 342. National averages for ownership requirements for social equity applicants range between 51 and 60%, and so this still maintains the high threshold envisioned by uh, authors and advocates last year, but also does provide that flexibility in financing. And then finally, we also would ask uh, for the, we propose giving social equity applicants or I'm sorry, the licensees, the ability to freely transfer those licenses after three years. Right now, they are only allowed to transfer those licenses to other social equity entities. And while well-intentioned to protect the license type and classification, that also limits the opportunity for these, for operators who have done well, but now want to move on uh, to, to sell their business and build generational wealth. That sort of restriction does not typically occur in other industries, and we believe that it would be appropriate not to place those restrictions after the first three years in, in operation. Our next bucket of proposals are in support of a timely market launch and, you, and through the use of temporary licenses. We hear often people's urgency for us to stand up this market, and we agree that doing our best to minimize the time between legalization and market launch is in everybody's best interest. Our proposal creates a mechanism for OCM to establish an application process in the summer of 2024, um, just mere months from now, uh, those limited early licenses for social equity applicants. This language does not allow operators to touch plants but does offer a substantial early mover advantage so that those licensees can establish business operations and prepare for the adoption of rules. A temporary early license for social equity applicants allows the assurance of a license that is critical in preparing, a business, preparing to open a business. We have seen that the biggest impediment to social equity applicants entering a market is the lack of access to capital because of the, the reasons I mentioned earlier. It is just not easy to secure capital when uh, cannabis is still a federally scheduled controlled substance. By doing so, we give an advantage to social equity applicants in obtaining that early license. We accelerate our path to market launch and we allow the entire industry to allow for an arduous application and vetting process to, get, to begin sooner rather than waiting for those rules to be adopted. Again, I would remind you that this application process for temporary licenses will also include the vetted steps of a lottery, including social equity status verification and thorough review of the merit-based licensing criteria in Chapter 342. Next, we want to accelerate the transition of the Office of Medical Cannabis and hemp-derived enforcement. Chapter 342 already accounts for the transition of the Office of Medical Cannabis and gives authority for the hemp-derived program to move from the Department of Health to the Office of Cannabis Management. We propose accelerating this transition from March of next year to July of 2024. This allows us to, early, to integrate those operations earlier. It allows for continuity of out operations and foundational capacity for OCM, which is still in the fledgling stand-up stages. And it gives us consistency, consistency in our enforcement of regulations. Additionally, we propose a pathway for current businesses selling <coughs> hemp-derived products 
who are registered with the state and in good standing to continue operating their businesses until they're able to obtain a license from OCM. Uh, as of two days ago, we had more than 3,800 registered retailers selling hemp-derived cannabinoid products on, in retail settings across the state. And if we don't allow some mechanism for those operators co to continue doing business while OCM is trying to process those licenses, we could inadvertently uh, cause substantial harm to and financial loss to those operators. We still expect them to meet the licensing structures and requirements in Chapter 342. We just want to make sure that if they are in good standing, they continue to, that they continue to operate until that license is issued. And then finally, we're working to address the need for continuity and patient access in the current medical program by moving the sunset date to the adoption of rules to help minimize any potential disruption that be, could be caused by unforeseen delays. There is a package of proposals to update the medical cannabis program and provide additional expansion of patient protections. Our bill includes those protections to, for medical cannabis cannabis patients, excuse me, while also maintaining sustainable access to high quality affordable products and access to professionals with expertise in the dosage and use of cannabis products to treat or alleviate symptoms of patients. The specific proposals include, pardon me, removing the financial burden for caregivers by removing the requirement for a caregiver to undergo a background check every two years at their own expense. This can be incredibly burdensome for caregivers who have to undergo the background check every two years when oftentimes the caregivers are family members or loved ones or uh, well known to the patient. We modify the patient supply limits to ensure that patients with differing medical needs have access to the medicines they depend on. And we establish a certified medical cannabis consultant for new medical retail endorsement holders to ensure that patients will have access to qualified patient information. Each of these provisions, it's important to note, are informed by feedback from the medical cannabis registry community of patients and caregivers. They are a robust and engaged community and they've been incredibly helpful in both educating, informing, and serving as thought partners to us. And then finally, the last bucket of proposals includes some technical res revisions including, uh, and those revisions will help clarify and strengthen the goals of implementation and robust regulation. It gives OCM the authority to issue product recalls in cases of consumer health and consumer safety. It modifies and clarifies the background check process <coughs> by separating the re review of licensee holders and controlling interest operators from that of cannabis workers. OCM believes that it is appropriate for us to make sure that we are doing background checks on every license holder and every uh, controlling interest partner who is on a license application and on an issued license. We also believe background checks are essential for every cannabis worker, but for OCM to conduct those background checks could be incredibly cumbersome, burdensome, and lead to market delay. We believe it is more appropriate for the business to be responsible for conducting those background checks and for OCM to assure it to ensure compliance with that requirement through regular monitoring, auditing, and compliance checks. OCM will conduct the first set of background checks with the license holders and the BCA would conduct those background checks for cannabis workers that are the responsibility of employers. We also outline high level offenses that show a history of explo exploitation of people or financial systems, because we do not believe that uh, license holders should have uh, been found convicted or found guilty of uh, those, those serious crimes. We also allow for research expansion by academic institutions. And then finally, we align the authority of the OCM director with that of other state agency heads to allow them to make the necessary decisions that will ensure high standards of operational efficacy and efficiency. And so with that, I gave you a lot of information in a relatively small amount of time and happy to turn it back over to Senator Port. Thank you, Interim Director Briner. And before we go further, let's get the bill in the shape the author would like it. Senator Wickland offers the A1 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A1 is adopted. 
Before we go to testifiers, I'll keep the interim director at the table to see if there are member questions or comments for her. In that case, thank you so much. Oh, Senator Frentz. Yes, thank you. I did have a couple of questions um, for the director. If you're taking them now, and I can also wait till after the testifiers, your preference. Senator Frentz, to your questions. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Port, very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Briner, for your outstanding work. And please share that thanks with the rest of your team. I know this is a huge lift. I just had a couple questions on behalf of some of the Minnesotans hoping to get the licenses. Um, we've heard in other states concerns about so-called flooding the zone or straw uh, applicants. Um, do you mind saying a little bit more about how we'll be working to prevent that from, you know, being some type of impediment for uh, those social equity applicants in particular, but, you know, all the potential candidates for licenses in general? And thank you again. If I didn't mention it, thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Interim Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Frentz. And I will definitely share your kind words with all of the staff that is working on this, both permanent OCM staff, the MDH team, as well as our uh, implementation team. This is not the work of one person. It is definitely a team effort and a team lift. Um, thank you for that question. I want to make very clear this is not pay to play. This is not an opportunity uh, to flood the system, as you, as you indicated. There is an important piece of our proposal that uh, folks should understand. It includes two tracks in the lottery round. There is the first round of, of lottery for verified and vetted social equity applicants. If they are not successful in obtaining a license in that lottery, they are automatically at no cost entered into the general lot lottery, giving them a second bite at the apple. And so, uh, that is an important consideration. It is not a per shot sort of you buy more tickets and you get more access. Second, we also know that there are substantial license fees in the bill for most license type that it correspond with the, the expense and industry knowledge required to open a business. That is a measure of skin in the game. Um, and those and it also reflects the kind of capital that's required to open the businesses. Um, take, for instance, a cultivator's license. Building a facility costs millions of dollars, and the fees to apply for that license are not insubstantial. And so it's not a statement on the value of the requirement as so, as so much as a, a kind of an indication of the reality of people's seriousness and ability to enter. This is really what um, we're talking about when we talk about screening for serious candidates. Finally, in the line of pay to play, those comments are very much in line with OCM's concerns about a point-based, subjective points-based system that exists. In a merit-based system, there is inherent advantage for well-funded applicants who have the means to prepare an application in accordance with the subjective and non-subjective criteria in the process. A merit-based system favors folks who already know how to strategize a, su a subjective system or who have the means to hire a consultant or an attorney who knows how to navigate that. We believe that a vetted lottery eliminates that subjective risk and also reflects uh, what the courts have looked on more kindly in other states when it comes to their suspicion of a points-based system. Thank you. It's, uh, Interim Director, Senator Friends, any follow-up? Well, first, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Briner. First of all, uh, I really appreciate you shining a little more light on that. We've had a lot of visits from those most interested in seeing that social equity applicants get a fair shake. I'm confident you're keeping an eye on it. Thank you for, thank you for mentioning the courts. I know one of the things you've worked hard on is to make sure that when we stand it up, everyone says, yep, this complies with everything it needs to comply with, and we don't have um, any unwanted uh, litigation impediments, if that's the right term for it. Mr. Chair, I appreciate the chance to ask a question. Ms. Briner, Senator Port, thanks for all your work. Um, looking forward to the rest of the hearing. Other member questions or comments for Interim Director Briner? We're going to go to testifiers then, and we'll do it in a rotation fashion. Uh, we have about 15 total. Can I have uh, Ms. Lily Fatehi and Ms. Amber Shimpa come to the table?
Welcome to the committee, Ms. Fatehi. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Laylee Fadahi, and I serve as the director of the Minnesota Cannabis Resource Center. Our mission is to advance a safe, equitable, and thriving cannabis industry in Minnesota. Built on the footprint of the MN is Ready Coalition, MCRC champions the principles that guided Minnesota's cannabis legalization. Last session, through an unparalleled collaboration between our legislators and local cannabis policy stakeholders, we created what is now known nationwide as a Minnesota model, the most innovative legislation enacted since Colorado first legalized over a decade ago. The Minnesota model is a testament to our collective vision of fostering an equitable, inclusive, and locally beneficial cannabis industry. It prioritizes Minnesota businesses and building a craft cannabis economy that benefits our local communities. Another hallmark is the hemp-derived THC product market that we invented in 2021, which is an invaluable on-ramp for small businesses to establish their presence and build capital en route to the adult use market. We're at a critical junction at the cusp of realizing the full potential of the Minnesota model. Large moneyed out-of-state interests are betting on our failure. They see our success as a barrier to their market entry and they're working hard to influence our licensing process, aiming to complicate and escalate the costs of application preparation in order to sideline our small local businesses. They thrive on introducing subjectivity wherever possible, hoping to gain our system and mire our process in litigation and delay. So as we delve into the complexities of this bill, particularly around the considerations of lottery versus merit-based licensing and the question of license caps, we should be reminded that these are not just procedural details. These are the battlegrounds on which the future of the Minnesota model will be decided. And it's imperative that our solutions remain true to the process and the principles that underpin our model. Um, uh, and that they're guided by the insights and needs of our local industry stakeholders. And this is something that we look forward to helping to support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fatehi. Our next testifier is Amber Shimpa, and after Ms. Shimpa will be Marin Joyce Schroeder. If Ms. Schroeder could approach the testimony table, please. Ms. Shimpa, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chairman Klein and members. My name is Amber Shimpa, and I'm the CEO of Vireo Health of Minnesota, one of Minnesota's medical cannabis licensees. I was personally present on July 1st of 2015 uh, when Virio served Minnesota's first medical patients. And for the past nine years, it's been an honor to lead our team while serving more than 55,000 Minnesotans with compassionate care. I am proud of the way we have supported my home state. With our community partners, we have advanced medical research and supported expungement and clemency efforts. And we have a nine-year track record of providing jobs for hundreds of Minnesotans and supported labor peace under a CBA with the UFCW Local 1189. We applaud the work that went into crafting last year's adult use bill and into laying the initial groundwork for the launch of adult use sales. The bill contained many common sense outcomes uh, like streamlining efforts to expunge nonviolent cannabis charges, generous home grow and possession limits, and the creation of the medical combination license which allows up to 90,000 square feet of cultivation capacity. Achieving a successful rollout of adult use program is a challenging undertaking and we have seen programs fail when the process begins to pit applicants and stakeholders against each other. Our shared responsibility as stewards of cannabis in Minnesota is to be stronger together. This isn't a zero sum game or winner takes all. A successful industry depends upon folks both competing and working together to have a robust supply chain. This supports good business, good product safety, and brings consumers to the regulated and taxed market. The demand for cannabis in Minnesota will be large enough to enable success at every level of the supply chain, but a minimally viable market launch with a slower tiered issuance of licenses and an efficient dual supply chain will put a successful program implementation at risk. Establishing licensing timeframes for all license types now will provide all applicants the visibility needed to ensure success in the market. Consumers want to access the quality products at affordable prices and making sure supply is adequate to meet this demand is crucial to curbing the illicit market, supporting public safety, and generating tax revenue. 
Unfortunately, last year's bill lacks a clear path to ensuring continuity of access for medical patients. For some patients, medical cannabis is a vital component for managing symptoms and living a fulfilling life. A responsible rollout in Minnesota will ensure that medical, medical patients can continue accessing these products that they rely on. Existing medical operators like Vireo are already experienced with the unique demands of regulated cannabis markets. Leaning on our experience and operations will also, while also supporting new businesses and social equity applicants will help ensure adequate supply to meet customer demand and prevent the illicit market from thriving. This will allow continuity for medical patients, enable success for small businesses and social equity applications, and protect hundreds of existing Minnesota jobs. Minnesotans deserve to have choices in their cannabis industry and a responsible common sense rollout that fully utilizes all available infrastructure can and should be part of this program's implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chimpa. Can Ms. Moon come to the table? Ms. Schrader, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein, members of the committee. My name is Marin Schroeder. I am here to testify on behalf of Sensible Change Minnesota, a patient and consumer-led uh, nonprofit advocacy organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have reviewed the legislation in detail and want to address a few items. First, there is little clarity as to what will happen to the existing medical cannabis manufacturers under the lottery proposal. It is our understanding that the lottery will apply to the medical cannabis combination license in which the two existing companies may apply to enter. However, there is no assurance that the existing infrastructure will be licensed and that numerous large companies won't come into Minnesota using that license type. While for years we have advocated a competitive marketplace for patients, we never envisioned one dominated by several large operators under this license type and do not want to see patients pitted against small businesses over this issue. The merit-based system currently in statute would likely advance the two medical cannabis manufacturers as they have a history of operations here in Minnesota and an infrastructure critical to the supply of medical cannabis for patients. <coughs> Excuse me. With a lottery, Patients are left facing uncertainty about the market, especially if licensed applicants are simply submitting documents ahead of actually preparing for business. Further, the proposed changes from a merit-based system to a lottery and the removal of prioritizing applicants who will serve the medical cannabis market puts into question the quality, pricing, and access to the medical cannabis products throughout the state. We are pleased to see the unification of supply chains in this proposal. This will help to reduce cost bottlenecks and provide ample choices for patients. The addition of certified medical cannabis consultants will make it easier and more achievable for retailers to offer medical cannabis products. We urge you to consider allowing for remote approvals um, in dispensing medical cannabis in addition to the consultations that are already allowed to be done remotely. This would vastly expand options for patients if retailers of all sizes all sizes can cost effectively make medical cannabis an integrated part of their business plan. Finally, the sooner this work focuses on opening up the market, the better served the patients are. With the combination of a lottery unification of the supply chain and removing prioritization for licenses that will serve medical cannabis patients, we are fearful that medical cannabis patients will continue to suffer the consequences of politics, something we've done a lot for the last decade. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schrader. Can Mr. John Barty please come forward? Ms. Moon, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Chris Moon with King Kind Cultivation. Lawmakers have been handed a challenging job, figuring, how, figuring out how to launch the cannabis market in Minnesota, which I'm sure you're coming to realize is no easy feat. We cannabis entrepreneurs understand your plight because we ourselves face tremendous adversity. From the complexities of being in a heavily regulated industry to the crime and stigma that come with cannabis, we persevere. So please understand what's at stake for the people who have dedicated their life to this craft. A lottery licensing system only creates more uncertainty and hardship for us. It's vulnerable to corruption and diminishes opportunities for local entrepreneurs, particularly social equity applicants. What's more, my success as a cultivator is directly tied to my peers. I can grow a superior product, but it doesn't do much good without prepared, competent colleagues to hand it off to. I am dependent upon them as they are on me. Our cannabis community is an ecosystem, a relationship where we, where we rely on one another to flourish. We need Minnesota's best and brightest stewards to successfully launch this market. Some of us are here today, many of us social equity candidates. 
We also need operational licenses like yesterday because there isn't a cannabis community without cannabis in the supply chain. Leaving this to chance is a disservice to consumers and your constituents. Minnesota deserves better. We can't do this right if the system is wrong. And some of the updates I've heard from the OCM this morning sound like a departure from the HF100's intent. Remain steadfast in that vision. We can have a safe and sustainable craft market anchored in social equity. Local entrepreneur entrepreneurs are ready to get to work and make that a reality. Help us fulfill our purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moon. Can Ms. Angela Dawson please come forward? Mr. Barty, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, I'm John Barty, president of the Cannabis Retailers and Manufacturers Association of Minnesota. I say thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Port. Thank you, members. And thank you, Director Briner, for your great presentation. Uh, we are a member driven organization of small and mid-sized operators throughout the state of Minnesota. Over the past two weeks, we've engaged in a number of member stakeholder meetings surrounding the proposed legislation, doing our best to explain the proposals and their impacts to current and prospective uh, business owners, understanding the good faith that went into these proposals. Many of these businesses have already begun preparing for a transition into the adult use market, and member feedback shows that the community and OCM are aligned on building this industry in a way that leads the nation. However, the proposed lottery licensing system is a cause for alarm amongst our members who have worked for the past 10 months to prepare for a merit-based scoring system that is already in law. Fearing large organizations will simply get more tickets to play, we believe that with these proposals, along with community-led amendments, that we can finish what we've set out here. We ask legislators, regulators, and OCM leadership to continue engaging with the community that has built Minnesota's cannabis industry since 2018, and to consider the hundreds of hours of engagement and feedback that built the merit-based system that we currently have. CRMA overwhelmingly approves of OCM's intent to speed up the licensing process. We believe that the current law but we believe that the current law allows for OCM to complete rulemaking and begin the licensing process quickly. We hope that if there are any hangups in the current law that we can focus on those and fix them. Um, yeah, and we remain open, as always, to conversations and these discussions. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Barty. Can Mr. John Hyduke please come forward? Ms. Dawson, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Klein, uh, Senator Port, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. My name is Angela Dawson. I am president of the 40 Acre Cooperative, uh, the first agricultural cooperative in the region that supports uh, black and indigenous farmers. Uh, and I'm also co-founder of The Great Rise, which has been inspiring conversations around the state, especially in the rural communities, uh, unifying folks around uh, access to cannabis and equity discussions. Uh, we've been um, especially exploring ways that cannabis can be an economic and agricultural development resource for our communities in places that have not had uh, support and resources for, for many years. I'm also honored to represent farmers on the Governor's Cannabis Advisory Council, and um, I, I continue to support uh, standing up a safe and legitimate uh, cannabis industry here this year. My comments are being presented mostly as a multi-generational farmer who has had experience cultivating medical cannabis in illegal states. Um, and then I'm also a licensed hemp farmer in the state of Minnesota for the past three years. Uh, with my time, I'd like to focus specifically on two areas of concern. The first is under the temporary licensing uh, section, uh, section 37.2. This area uh, essentially prohibits uh, cultivators from cultivating, and, which I think is counterintuitive to the goal of standing up a legitimate aid, uh, industry in 2025. To be put plainly, if cultivators are not allowed to cultivate, then we will not have an industry to stand up in 2025. It takes at least 12 months from seed uh, to, in order to have product to be ready for the market. Uh, and my concern is that in the meantime, while we are waiting for uh, product to be legally and safely grown, that the illicit market will continue to proliferate and only folks who have large corporate interests or who are willing to operate illegally are, will be able to benefit and prosper 
In the meantime, social equity businesses and farmers will be left holding the bag or carrying the water as we uh, try to maintain uh, compliance with the law and still try to operate viable businesses. Uh, I just want the committee to be aware of the conundrum this might create for folks who are trying to stay in compliance with the laws while remaining financially viable when we're not really set up to succeed. We must be allowed to plant this year in order to stand up a legitimate industry next year. Um, and so I hope that we can use the infrastructure that's currently in place with the medical program and with the hemp programs to be able to do this while preventing uh, diversion or any other uh, spoilage of product. Uh, I also share concerns about the lottery system. I feel like um, there, I'm not, I don't know enough about what the vetting looks like for uh, pre-lottery applicants in order to say that I am in support of a system like this. I feel like the way that it's explained right now, it may be creating more harm than help, uh, but I'm also standing ready to work with the OCM and others in order to, to support a good system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Can Mr. Bob Wallach please come to the table? Mr. Hyduke, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Uh, John Hyduke, uh, partner in Highway 35 Cannabis, uh, also board chair of the Minnesota Marijuana Association. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I am a lifelong resident of Minnesota, growing up in uh, Hibbing, raising my family in Duluth, currently live in Eden Prairie, and operate my business marketing company in the North Loop of Minneapolis. Um, the MMA was organized to build a coalition of like-minded enthusiasts from both across and outside the state, including all groups of size, both SE, social equity, and commercial, using the cornerstone legislation uh, from 2023 uh, as our guiding North Star to prepare and get ready to stand up the newest industry in our, in our cannabis uh, industry safely with stability and certainty. Uh, our th Highway 35 project that I'm involved in is to provide an economic boost and stability to a region I grew up in and vowed to help with job creation one day. And that time has come with this new legalized cannabis uh, industry. Uh, the ability to partner with experience was critical to the business plan, which calls for social equity partnering to ensure the intent of the legislation is carried out uh, better and more successful than any other state uh, in the country. Uh, we believe merit-based, not lottery, uh, is the fair way uh, which needs operators to uh, be ready to operation, operationalize a license and prevent gamesmanship. Uh, merit is the legislation that all these folks, uh, our members, have been preparing for uh, with time, resources, money, and are ready to stand up the industry. A lottery is a game of chance. Uh, standing up cultivation, as you've heard today, uh, will be a challenge. Uh, we have the smallest uh, existing cannabis industry uh, moving into adult rec, and we need operators that are ready to go. Both social equity and commercial operators uh, are ready to go uh, and can jumpstart the industry in a timely fashion. Uh, as the governor has said, uh, timeliness is critical. In terms of Litigation. Uh, litigation will come, but it doesn't have to interfere with the standing up of the industry, and it hasn't in most states and that, uh, uh, that have run the merit-based system. A well-run, transparent, merit-based system, as envisioned by the 2023 statute, can be insulated from the risk of litigation. Lotteries are vulnerable to litigation as well, and the downsides associated with the lotteries vastly outweigh any perceived advantage that they have, like exposure to litigation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can Holly's Winston please come to the table? Mr. Bob Wallach, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today to the committee. Thank you, Senator Porter. My name is Bob Wallach. I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer of Canada Joy <clears throat> MN. We're a mom and pop seed shop in South Minneapolis, living our dream, owning and operating our small store. Um, we'd like to think we meet people where they're at on their seed and weed journey by guiding customers and home growers to finding the right hemp derived products and seeds for their home grow. I've come here today to request that you please continue to keep small businesses in mind, ones like ours. The additional burden of a lottery is a probability for our finances that is hard to swallow. I think the reality 
of a merit-based system and the potential corruption and complexities that can come with creating a system that will find the best players in the industry is probably a foolhardy choice. We are left with two options. One that's nearly impossible to pick the best players by whatever system we decide to create, or one where we do it randomly. I would propose a third option, one where we give licenses to nearly all that are applied. In this case, we don't stop the freedom of those individuals who want to start a business. And we don't create subjective rubrics that stop and only are allowing some companies to start operations. I understand this might seem different from prior legislation or from current legislation, but it's the only option that realistically avoids corruption and at the same time stops the infuriating nature of a lottery. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Can Rashad Iman please come to the table? <clears throat> Mr. Winston, please introduce yourself and proceed. So my name is uh, Hollis Winston. I just uh, want to make it clear. Uh, I am mayor of a city in the metro area. I'm not here in that capacity. Uh, I am here, uh, and I want to thank the committee and chair for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I am here uh, as uh, someone who works for the Coalition for Equity and, Legal and Legalization. Uh, we were asked to get involved with this uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, the stated purpose of much of this legislation was to undo the harm from the war on drugs, uh, but also to give opportunity opportunity to folks who are affected by that uh, as well, which we think can really affect some of the disparities that Minnesota has been dealing with quite some time, whether it comes to unemployment, whether it comes to wealth or uh, business ownership. We also work with organizations like Create C, who you'll hear from so shortly. I think we're opposed to the bill uh, as it's written currently is because it disincentivizes uh, businesses from getting involved, especially uh, BIPOC, people of color, African-American owned businesses where there's already a struggle for capital. When you throw a lottery into place and people have had to spend $300,000 up front, there may be better returns on investment for them uh, because it's just so risky. Uh, I think the other piece is that it does encourage the use of straw applicants, people who come in and will use, for lack of a better word, a bunch of black faces or brown faces to put as many applications as the pool as they want. Uh, and there's ways to still hit the minimal qualifications and play that straw game. I think uh, this does not embed equity into the process. So when you think of some of the racism that people are concerned about uh, in terms of people getting licenses, putting a, lice, a, a lottery in place rather than looking at some of the underlying causes for what, why people haven't gotten licenses across the country uh, is a serious concern. I think you have to deal with the equity piece head on. You cannot deal with it simply through chance. Uh, it also moves the goalpost. So uh, when you've asked people to bring their, put their best foot forward, put investment forward, do all the work necessary, and then you say, well, we're going to throw a lottery at you, that runs contrary to just basic American principles of fairness. So I think we are advocating very, very much for a uh, point system. We do understand the uh, early temporary uh, licenses will help with uh, the flow of capital, but I think and then I'll close on this. I think it's incredibly important when um, you have the OCM that there's an opportunity to really address some of the disparities that we're seeing at the state. The way it looks right now, it's either going to just continue those disparities or at worst, if this is botched, you will increase those disparities because you will create a brand new industry in which people of color are losing out and those disparities become even worse. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Winston. Can Calandra Reverend come to the table uh, Senator Frentz, we see that you're looking for acknowledgement. We're going to get through our testifiers, and then we will call on you. Uh, Mr. Iman, please uh, introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm a, um, <coughs> sorry. I'm a uh, business owner, and I'm with the Collective for Racial Equity and African American Talent in Cannabis, or CREATE, C. Uh, we have uh, 14 members, uh, business, owners, business owners and community members, whose goal is to create jobs and opportunities for black and brown uh, people who have mostly been affected by the prohibition of cannabis. Um, it's extremely difficult uh, <clears throat> in getting a collective of people to trust the possible outcome of an opportunity that may not happen with people who have a history of being marginalized, taking advantage of in all aspects, especially financial commitment, where now you implement a lottery that says, thanks for the efforts, nice try. 
Um, we are, we've been the most affected by the war on drugs. I mean, if not, if you don't know that, watch the movie 13th by director uh, Ava DuVernay, DuVernay on Netflix. If social equity is important to this industry and the OCM, then you may want to listen to the people who have uh, the most experience in that aspect and been the most affected. We've always been, been we've always had uh, been missed out on opportunities when it comes to a lot of the industry train changes, whether that's the industrial age, whether that's dot com, uh, whether that's Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera. We're always on the tail end of the aspect, and we're trying to you know basically get ahead of the game, if you will. Our goal, the goalpost is always being moved. The OCM says that the lottery, they'll, they will be vetting applicants beforehand. But if biases exist and those vetting don't represent me, we're still subject to, those, to how individuals feel. This is why we want license based on hard work and determination rather than a lottery. We've shared our concerns with the OCM, but it's fallen on deaf ears, apparently rather than listening to the people with the merit who's community has been most affected by the prohibition, uh, they believe they know what's best. We don't need hand-holding. We're intellectuals, professionals, business owners, business owners, and we're perfectly capable of protecting ourselves from outside predators, if you will. CREATE-C uh, is uh, equity through social equity of cannabis, and we're just looking for our fair chance, if you will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Iman. Can D. Tommy Beavis please come forward? Ms. Revering, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Senate. My name is Calandra Revering. I am the owner of a dispensary in Brooklyn Park. I am also the founder of Minnesota Association for Black Cannabis Professionals, professionals and I am also a member of the Defense Bar. As a member of this, just, as a Minister of just, Justice, I often speak for this entire community. I no longer trust or have confidence in the OCM to create policies that advance the interests of social equity applicants. With this new proposal, it has not only delayed the process, but the OCM has just created a path for multi-state operators to create a footprint in Minnesota. Partnering with a social equity applicant, even if the applicant owns more than 50%, does not help the applicant in obtaining funds. What it does is it creates predatory partners. What we have seen in other states is that partnering with these MSOs, <clears throat> the operating agreement rules the day. Within this operating agreement, many of these social equity partners will not even obtain a piece of the revenue until the MSO earns a certain amount of revenue that bar can be very high. <clears throat> As one of my seasoned colleagues called it, and this colleague has opened cannabis businesses in other states, this practice is called rent a minority. There is no advantage to social equity applicants under the OCM's proposal. There are no landlords in this state who are willing to hold property with no rent and no money until the potential applicant obtains a license. Because un the, under this proposal, there are no transactions that can happen. There are no cultivators that can grow cannabis. <clears throat> As an attorney who often speaks about social equity issues in cannabis, I have always said this Minnesota bill was written for Minnesotans by Minnesotans. I no longer feel that way. This lottery system proposed by the OCM feels like the Minnesota that I've always tried to get away from, the Minnesota nice, smiling in your face while shutting you out of opportunities for your own benefit. While I share Ms. Briner's concerns about those who have had an advantage to obtain consultants and attorneys in preparing their application, I can tell you that social equity applicants feel even more defeated by the OCM's proposal, and their trust has been completely diminished at this point, even though I've tried to rebuild the trust in this commun community with the Minnesota government. <clears throat> 
I implore you, improve the merit system by researching other states more on their process, such as Vermont, who has had no challenges to their point system in court. Release grant funding to the community so that this state can create a method to educate and help social ap applicants in the, in the process by understanding the process, such as New York has done by giving free community classes. <clears throat> I think that if the OCM works with community stakeholders instead of a consultant, they will reduce the likelihood of litigation by me and my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reverend. Can Mr. Can Maso, Maso Phillips please come forward? Mr. Beavis, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. I am Tommy Beavis. I am representing Create C Coalition, but in my day job, I happen to lead Pimento Jamaican Kitchen, which has four locations across the Twin Cities. Amazing award-winning food. Um, but Pimento is more than a restaurant. After the 2020 uprisings, the community created Pimento Relief Services, which focuses on economic liberation, political liberation, and social liberation. And the cannabis issue falls squarely within that space because through economic liberation, this gift provides us the tools and the resources to provide our own solutions within our own community. From a social liberation standpoint, it addresses a lot of the social ills and social injustices that have been done. And this is actually a reparative justice um, opportunity for us all. And then from a political liberation standpoint, it challenges us to really stand up and right some of the wrongs that have been done historically. And so um, I'm here to oppose the lottery um, clause, particularly because I see this as a huge financial risk for social equity applicants. Um, the, the, it removes that social equity objectives and goals that we were setting out for. And then what it does is provides an invisible hand to pick winners and losers. And what, what I'm afraid of is by picking the wrong winners, then those winners fail, then the narrative is continually perpetuated. See, black businesses can't succeed. And so we have to get it right this time. For example, right now, I've already invested quite a lot in the branding, the marketing, the research, the consultants to try to figure out what it would look like using the existing laws. And by adding the lottery, that then gives me the, the, the two options. Do I stop where I am and lose all that I've invested? Or do I continue to invest more funds in some cost efforts? This is not fair. And of course, we already have limited access to capital. This makes sure that we have no access to capital because no investor would want to invest in anything that is based on a lottery. And in, fine, in closing, I think my recommendations would be for us to continue to focus on improving the point-based system, the merit-based system, because I think this is an opportunity for those who are ready to really step up and create the next great Minnesota companies. And then, of course, we also would like to see that we have funds available um, to do the research and to support us as we're trying to go about this. So let's release some deed funds to the social equity applicants as soon as possible. This is our opportunity to get it right now for the purposes of social, economic, and political liberation. So let's get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beavis. Mr. Phillips, please introduce yourself and go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you guys for your time. My name is Maceo Phillips, and I'm also with CREATE-C. And I'm going to keep this short and sweet because a lot of my members already spoke on some of the issues. But um, I'm opposed to the, um, the lottery system, and I really support the um, merit system, especially for the ones who's been greatly affected, like a lot of my brothers and sisters. I remember growing up in Brooklyn Park, um, it was just almost like um, we were terrorists and we were vilified just for smoking marijuana, and it caused a lot of ramifications with um, a lot of my people, and that's why I think y'all should take that in consideration because a lot of the BIPOC or black and brown people, especially in like the outside suburbs of Minneapolis and stuff like that, we just felt like we were targeted and vilified and kind of like outlawed. And now that since it's um, legal, that um, I don't think anybody else should be really like taking advantage of it when, you know what I'm saying, they wasn't the ones targeted like most of the people that was in the inner cities. And um, it had a great impact. There was a lot of jail time. It was a lot of treatment and stuff everybody had to go through. And it was just a lot of um, shame by just making us feel like the bad guy all the time. And I think, you know, we should get some type of justice in that and be able to, 
you know what I'm saying, be able to take control of our communities and get it back and be able to profit off of it since we was greatly affected. But um, thank you guys for your time and thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Are there other members of the public who wish to testify? Come forward. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Sure thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of this committee. Uh, my name is Nathan Young, and I am the Canvas Policy Lead for the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm here to present testimony representing the MBCC's strong opposition uh, to this bill. At the core of our opposition is the switch from a merit-based system to a lottery. Lotteries do not put social equity applicants on even footing with other competitors. In fact, lotteries make it much more unfair. In every instance, every single instance, when a state has used a lottery to distribute cannabis social equity licenses, black applicants in particular have fallen victim to predatory deals made by big businesses seeking straw applicants. Businesses seeking a way to rig the system in their favor create dozens of opaque LLCs and pay vulnerable members of our community to use their name and details as owners of those businesses. These owners have no operational control over the business and up, uh, one year after the license is granted, a term in their contract forces them to sell their shares to the predatory investor, effectively stripping them of their license and livelihood for pennies on the dollar. This is not only unfair for the unassuming black entrepreneurs who fall victim to the scheme, it is deeply unfair to the numerous black entrepreneurs, many of whom are already working on their business plans, who worked hard to build a viable business only to lose on chance to a big business who cheated their way in. And that's why every single social equity expert who has been asked on this issue has come out against lotteries. That includes the NAACP, the Minority Cannabis Business Association, the Washington State Commission on African Affairs, the Los Angeles County Commission on Social Equity, and the Coalition for African American Talent and Cannabis. All of these groups strongly oppose lotteries. And I want to take just one moment to address uh, uh, a remark that uh, uh, Chair Chairwin uh, Briner uh, kind of made, and that was on the fact that they were going to stand up and make sure that none of these straw applicants met in, that make sure that we weren't able to flood the zone with applications. Every single regulator stood before a body like this and made that same promise in each one of the seven states uh, where they put this lottery in place. In Arizona, a regulator stood before a body just like this and made that same promise. The end result of that is of the 26 social equity licenses that were uh, granted, 25 of them were found to be owned by a business owner who did not qualify for social equity status. And the Senate right now is in, in session trying to undo the mess that they made. In Illinois, um, which uh, by many uh, lottery advocates uh, uh, position is considered a success, 40% of the applications uh, that were granted in that lottery went to businesses who submitted the maximum number of applications technically allowed under the law. That is the exact definition of flooding the zone. So uh, about 10 businesses flooded the zone, got the maximum number of licenses, and they were granted 40% of the licenses. There is no way to avoid gamesmanship under a lottery uh, uh, provision, and that is why we are strongly against it. Minnesotans deserve an adult use cannabis market that is served by real people who care about the communities that they're in. Minnesotans deserve a fair chance to participate in that market and not a rigged system that is pay to win. We understand that after several delays, this state would like to fast track adult use cannabis licensing, but we cannot prioritize speed over doing the right thing. We hope that you will stop, help us stop this critically flawed legislation and work with us to protect black and brown community members from harm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have another member of the public. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Sean Tatro. I represent King Kind Cultivation. I'm here to voice opposition to the proposed lottery in favor of a merit-based application process. Current data proves neither are insulated from potential litigation. Information does, however, indicate that a merit-based system creates a more robust and sustainable cannabis market. Minnesota has an opportunity to avoid the pitfalls that have plagued other states. Many aspects of this process require prudent consideration, particularly as it pertains to social equity status, application eligibility thresholds, and the sequential distribution of temporary licensing. 
Temporary licensing may be limited to social equi equity applicants. Therefore, a logical first step would be a process to qualify social equity status. Beyond the implementation of a merit-based system, reasonably high standards for application eligibility should exist for several reasons. It limits the amount of applications to allow for a more thorough review. It protect, protects small Minnesota entrepreneurs and the public and awards licensing to the most qualified applicants with the shortest path to becoming operational. Cultivators provide supply to the supply chain. All other sectors require this supply to operate. Cannabis op entrepreneurs are doomed to fail in the absence of a steady, abundant supply chain. Establishing a protocol that grants temporary licensing based on the timeline required to become operational is crucial. And each sector has different lead times required to become operational. This is critical for businesses with a small runway for operations. Coordinating the sequential disbursement of temporary licenses to allow for all or most sectors to become operational simultaneously is imperative because no one can operate correctly unless everyone is operating properly. We are all in this together. Thank you. And the last member of the public, uh, introduce yourself and go ahead. My name is Matt Carpentier. I, am, uh, I own Carpfish Creative, where you do business advising, and we work with national advisors in the cannabis industry. And I'm opposed to the lottery system, uh, especially after talking to numerous people across the great state of the or United States. Mainly one of the big things with the lottery system that I've heard and the issues that are happening in New York and they're expected to happen in New Jersey is the what they call stacking or flooding. It's where investment groups will target multiple groups of social equity applicants and then they will maximize the number of applications to, uh, to those. And then a lot of the times, like in here, we have a three-year turnover where the license can be um, transferred over. A lot of the times they will in their agreements, they will have it so that social equity person after that three years has, gets nothing out of it in most cases. Um, that was the main thing. I think the OCM has done a great job so far up to that, um, up to the lottery discussion. I think they've structured it. The original bill structured great. Everything looks great. It's just the lottery thing is the only thing. I mean, if you look at the Highway 35 project, that could be a project that maybe only has a 10% chance in a lottery system and they're doing all the right things. They're raising money. I believe they've already raised something like 20 million, I think I saw in a CARE 11 news article. And it would be really hurtful to people like that who've done all the work and done all the real stuff to run a business to just lose it just because of the lottery. That's it. Thank you, testifiers. Thank you. We can call on Senator Friends, but Senator Port, maybe you just want to respond to the testifier. It seems like there were some themes uh, that came forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, and thank you to all the testifiers who came. This is exactly the kind of input that we got consistently throughout the year last year, and it helped to create a really strong bill at the end of the day that uh, we were all proud to see signed into law. And I am hopeful and ex have the same expectation that that will be the process this year. Um, I, I want to address, first of all, the lottery. It is a complicated uh, process and weighing of litigation versus speeding things up versus what are our core values at this point. And I just want to reiterate that my core value at this point, and I think the core value of all of the folks who've worked um, on this bill and who are working at OCM to do this, is to make sure that we stand up an industry that is specific to Minnesota. That means that it prioritizes and protects social equity applicants, that it uh, prioritizes those smaller micro and mezzo businesses, really the cannabis craft industry, um, that Minnesota can be a leader in, in the country on setting up. Um, I think the other things that are critical at this moment are standing up enforcement uh, quickly, because we already know that we, we need those powers, OCM to have those powers. We need to get testing up and running. We need to get cultivation up and running. Um, and we can do all of that while ensuring that the system that we set up, whether it is this lottery-based system or whether it is a modification of the points-based system that we wrote into law in the first place, it can be done with cooperation and collaboration between OCM 
and community, and I believe that is very, very likely to happen. OCM has been incredible to work with, um, really giving time to folks to have conversations, and I look forward to helping uh, continue to make sure that's true. And the final piece I want to say is protecting access for patients to medical cannabis has been a core principle of this legislation, and it will stay a core principle of this legislation. Sir Fritz. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Port. I think you answered every single question I was going to ask. I think we're hearing uh, questions about merit versus lottery. I appreciate your hard work, Senator Port. I think the intent of the legislation was to legalize adult use cannabis. You got that. Our intent was to provide preference for the social equity applicants. I see that you have that in spirit, and I think these testifiers are asking if we can get a little better uh, fix on it in letter. And I will just add, Mr. Chair and members, this last week, like many of you, had a number of Minnesotans in my office saying that they were concerned about straw buyers and were concerned about flooding the zone. And I, we do have that in other areas um, like this. And so I don't know that the problem can be completely solved, but I think after today's hearing, we should make it a priority. Senator Port, uh, you have our support for what you see as the best path forward. And again, I think uh, Ms. Bryan and her team have worked very hard. That's not another Minnesota value is hard work. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Other member questions or comments? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that we will be getting this bill back um, as a committee to discuss further. I did have just uh, two brief amendments I wanted to offer today. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, I'd move the A7. Senator Rasmussen offers the A7 amendment. Is it in our packets or being distributed, members? Uh, while being distributed, Senator Rasmussen, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the stated goals of the cannabis bill last year was to curtail the illicit market. And I think, unfortunately, you know, we have seen from the work of OCM and others that there are um, many instances of the law being broken currently with illicit sales of cannabis. Um, and I've actually heard about this issue from legal retailers in the area that I represent, that they're frustrated that while they are complying with the law during this interim phase, while they're waiting for uh, licenses for higher potency cannabis to be issued and that regulatory infrastructure to be stood up, um, that they effectively have competitors who are ignoring the law and breaking the law. And so the A7 amendment would show that we take very seriously any violations that have taken place uh, since the cannabis bill was passed last year um, and would say that the Office of Cannabis Management cannot issue a cannabis business license to any person or business uh, who has had a violation or been convicted of illegally selling uh, cannabis. And so I think this is really important to show, especially as we're in this interim period, that um, you can't break the law. And if you want to sell cannabis, you have to follow the law and wait for the legal licensing uh, to do so. To the amendment, Senator Port or uh, Interim Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Rasmussen. I appreciate that you brought this to me before um, committee so I was able to look at it. I think there are important things in this bill that are moving towards that, uh, highlighting moving those enforcement resources and infrastructure over more quickly um, to make sure that OCM is able to actually enforce what we wrote in the law. Um, I'm open to continuing this conversation. I think in spirit, this is exactly what we are, you know, looking for is making sure that there aren't folks who are willfully coming into Minnesota to set up businesses, to try to get a head start. Um, you know, this is, this is sort of part of that whole problem. Um, so I'm happy to continue discussing it with you. I think it might be part of a broader conversation as we move through committees. And so um, respectfully, I'd ask for you to hold off on it now or ask members for a no vote, but I would love to continue working with you on this. Sir Rasmussen, any response? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I, I um, think this is really important because uh, right now there's a lot of illegal sales taking place in the state of Minnesota. I know the Office of Campus Management uh, is looking for more resources to address that, which I think is important and good. But I just want to make sure that we, we tell Minnesotans that if you're breaking the law in this interim period, that you're not going to be able to get a legal license. I think that would be a very uh, important consequence. 
And so, Mr. Chair, I would ask, I see Director Briner is at the table. I wonder if she has any response to this proposal and if things would be merit to adopting it. Director Briner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. We absolutely agree at OCM that people should be expected to follow the law at all stages of the legalization process. That is one of the reasons that we want to accelerate the transition so that we have both consistency and enforcement and we have a direct line of sight into actors who are not operating within the law and we can use that information to inform our licensing decisions in the future. So I appreciate um, Senator Port's willingness to continue to engage in conversation and we would love to be a resource in those continuing conversations. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that. And I would, yeah, it, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily this language, but something that strengthens um, what we have in the bill to just make sure that uh, we aren't going to be handing licenses to people who are currently breaking the law and will continue to break the law before those licenses get stood up. Um, so I'll withdraw the A7 and uh, look forward to continued conversations. Senator Rasmussen withdraws the A7 amendment. Other member questions, comments, or amendments? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the A6 amendment, and I'm happy to describe the amendment. Senator Rasmussen offers the A6 amendment while being distributed to your amendment. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so one of the unique features of last year's cannabis bill is that while it made uh, consumption and possession for individuals under the age of 21 illegal, there was no explicit penalties in the bill um, for underage consumption or possession. Um, and so effectively, the, it, it falls to this catch-all statute where if you violate the law, you're guilty of a petty misdemeanor, which uh, for those who don't know, that's effectively a traffic ticket. And so today in Minnesota law, if you have uh, someone who's underage consuming alcohol, they face real penalties. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a misdemeanor for them. Um, however, if law enforcement, school officials, local prosecutors find someone who's underage who uh, has cannabis in their possession or is using it, they face little to no penalties. So the point where local law enforcement has told me that there's really no effective means of enforcing underage consumption and possession. So what the A6 Amendment does is it, it takes a bipartisan bill, actually, that has been introduced in, in both uh, uh, the Senate and the other body, um, and it would take the penalties that we currently have for underage uh, possession and consumption of alcohol and apply it to cannabis, and we actually have uh, fewer penalties in this amendment than there are for alcohol because we have nothing about suspending driver's licenses or anything else uh, beyond the criminal penalties li listed here. And so I think this is a common sense move if we care about preventing underage consumption, we have to give local law enforcement and prosecutors some penalties uh, to make sure that there's some teeth behind this underage prohibition. Before we go to Senator Port's response, members, uh, the A6 creates misdemeanor criminal penalties, which is outside the scope of this committee and appropriate for the Judiciary Committee. On that basis alone, I'll request a no vote on the amendment. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Um, I also ask for a no vote. Uh, the disparity of enforcement around cannabis is very well documented. Uh, if you are a black man or black child, uh, you are more than 11, 11 times more likely to be prosecuted and convicted of a cannabis crime than a white person. And they use uh, white communities and communities of color use cannabis at roughly the same rate. This is the core of the harms of prohibition. The place where we addressed this in, the, in, in our original legislation was that we made the strongest penalties in the bill to be sales to minors. That is where we should be looking at enforcement, uh, not looking at a very unfairly enforced system that we know because we have the documentation um, targeting kids of color. Um, I will also say that, you know, I grew up in a town where on weekends during high school, there were parties in cornfields outside of town with significant amounts of alcohol and a lot of white kids. And never once were those, you know, even if the cops came, no one was actually charged. Uh, we know that same uh, is not true for particularly young black men. Um, I believe that this continues to 
perpetuate that harm that we are trying to undo, uh, perpetuate that school to prison pipeline. And for those reasons, I oppose this amendment. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the conversation on this amendment, and I'm, I hope that as this bill goes to the Judiciary Committee, where I agree it's, it's perhaps more germane that this will be discussed and brought up. And the, the goal of this amendment, and, I, and the goal of having penalties for underage consumption, is to actually protect those who are underage. We have decided as a state, we know from research on cannabis, uh, the harmful effects that cannabis can have on young people um, and their development. And I think it's really important that we give local law enforcement prosecutors, judges, tools that they need uh, to address underage consumption. And from talking with law enforcement today, they don't feel like they have those tools that they have for underage consumption of alcohol. Um, so Mr. Chair, this I think is an important conversation and I hope that we continue it, but I'll withdraw the A6 at this time. Senator Rasmussen withdraws the A6 amendment. Any further member questions, comments, or amendments to the bill? Closing comments, Senator Port. Uh, you know, thank you very much to the committee uh, and thank you to all the testifiers. I look forward to a robust conversation over the coming weeks. I uh, look forward to partnership with all of you as we have this conversation. And I will be back with you in four weeks or so. Thank you, Senator Port. Can uh, the online senators please turn on your microphones for the voice vote? Uh, the question is on the motion of Senator Wickland that Senate File 4782 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband and Rural Development. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion is passed. Senator Port, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Klein, to your bill. 
Thank you, Chair and members, for uh, hearing Senate File 4097. I have an A1 delete all uh, author's amendment for your consideration. Senator Klein moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senate File 4097 as amended is the Commerce Omnibus Policy uh, Bill for this year. I will have counsel walk through the uh, bill as amended. Uh, there are no bills contained in here which we did not hear uh, in committee. Uh, and uh, I appreciate members' work this session to get this put together. Uh, and with that, I'll go to counsel for a walk through the bill. Ms. Severson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'll just be doing a very high level walkthrough of the bill, um, outlining where the language um, specifically came from this year. Article one contains primarily insurance policy. Section one and two is from Senator Frentz's Senate file 1037 on cost of frail. Section three and four is from Senator Dames's Senate file 4218 on township mutual fire insurance companies and mergers. Section five to seven is from Senator Limmer's Senate file 3846 on property insurance for transfer on death deeds. Article two is policy related to financial institutions. Sections one to 11 is from Senate, Senator Klein's Senate file 4157, which makes various technical changes. Section 12 to 13 is from Senator Gus Gustafson's Senate File 3932 on consumer loan interest rates. Sections 14 to 17 is from Senator Rasmussen's Senate File 5031 on payroll services and money transmissions. Sections 19 to 33 are additional sections from Senator Klein's Senate File 4157. Sections 34 to 40 is from Senator Latz's Senate File 3358 on bail bonds. Sections 41 to 50 is from Senate, Senator Klein's Senate File 4156, which makes additional technical changes to existing statutes. Article three contains policy related to commercial regulation and consumer protection. Section one is from Senator Seeberger's Senate File 4138 on residential real estate consumer protections. Sections 2 to 11 is from Senator McEwen's Senate File 4909 on virtual currency. Sections 12 to 25 is from Senator Umu Verbaten's Senate File 4735 on student loan providers and lenders. Sections 20, section 26 is an additional section from Senator Seeberger's Senate File 4138. Sections 27 and 28 is from Senator Russ, Senate File 4163 on exemptions for non-oxygenated gasoline. Sections 29 to 32 are from Senator Francis, Senate File 3909 on abnormal market disruption and unconscionable excessive price prohibit prohibitions. Sections 33 to 35 are from Senator Mike McQuaid's Senate File 411 4114, modifying consumer protection provisions on flame resistant public assembly tents and sleeping bags. Section 36 is from Senator Mann, Senate File 3972 on aerosol duster purchasing and labeling requirements. Section 37 is from Senator Klein's Senate File 2003, regulating ticket sales. Sections 38 to 40 is from Senator Gustafson's Senate File 4351, regulating the advertisement distribution distribution and sale of certain vapor products. Section 41 is from Senator Gustafson's Senate File 3530, prohibiting cell phone cases that resemble firearms. Section 42 and 43 are from Senator Gustafson's Senate File 3920, which regulated automatic renewal subscriptions. Section 44 is from Senator McEwen's Senate File 3678, requiring disclosures on handheld devices in restaurants. Sections 45 to 52 are additional sections from Senator Gustafson's Senate File 3530. Section 53 to 60 are from Senator Gustafson's Senate File 4314, modifying provisions related to coerced debt. Section 61 is an additional section from Senator Seeberger's Senate File 4138. 
Article 4 contains liquor policy. Section 1 is from Senator Frentz's Senate File 4820, modifying the definition of a hotel. Section 2 is from Senator Dibble's Senate File 2268, modifying the City of Minneapolis liquor license. Section 3 is from Senator Rasmussen, Senate File 1306, which authorizes the transfer of wine. Section 4 is from Senator Pratt's, Senate File 5050, modifying the City of St. Paul's liquor license. Section 5 is from Senator Carlson, Senate File 3341, authorizing an on-sale liquor license for the City of Egan. Section 6 is from Senator Lang's, Senate File 4557, authorizing an on-sale license for town ball games in the city of Litchfield. Article five contains several updated effective dates from last year's policy bill. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. Senator Klein. Uh, Madam Chair, I know members have amendments. I have three amendments to make sure the bill is corrected, but if you like, we can go to testifiers and then do those amendments. I have three testifiers, Peter, Peter Brick, Brickwetty, Ward Inus, and Kyle Macarios. I'm sorry. All right, John Kelly. Hey. <laughs> All right, Mr. Kelly, please identify yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. For the record, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Apologies. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Brickery is stuck in the other body. Um, so uh, the department uh, speaks today uh, and is grateful for the inclusion of the six Commerce Department policy bills included in uh, Senate File 4097, the Commerce Policy Omnibus Bill. They are as follows. The underlying bill, which is the Commerce Technical and Housekeeping Bill for the 2024 session, as well as Senate File 4139, the Commerce Weights and Measures Policy Bill carried by the chair. Senate File 4139, 4138, the Commerce Consumer Protection Bill also carried by the Chair. Uh, Senate File 4156, the Commerce Securities Policy Bill carried by Chair Klein. Uh, Senate File 4157, Commerce Financial Institutions Policy Bill also carried by Chair Klein, which was combined with Senate File 4376, which is the CSBS Non-Bank Security Act originally authored by Senator Rest. These bills represent the department's efforts to modernize key provisions in Minnesota statutes and rules that govern telecommunications, securities, banking, and mortgage industries, update the laws relating to blends of gasoline, protect Minnesota consumers, and make clear which insurance policy is in effect when there are loss assessments for condo and townhome owners. These bills, if passed this session, will help to clean up existing statutes, remove red tape, protect consumers and their data, and help ensure Minnesota industries will continue to prosper and grow into the future. We are proud to say that all of the department bills in the omnibus were made stronger by amendments added in committee that were the result of feedback from industry and stakeholders. There are still several uh, provisions included in the omnibus that the department is working with members and stakeholders to attempt to reach consensus. We are committed to continuing to work with Chair Klein, legislators, stakeholders, industry groups as the bill moves forward to make it as strong as possible and our hope is that we can reach more agreements in the coming weeks. Thank you for your time today and for your work this session on, in the committee on behalf of all Minnesotans. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Our next testifier is Ward Inus. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, my name is Ward Inus. I'm here on behalf of the American Bail Coalition. The American Bail Coalition includes a number of Minnesota-based bail companies, and we're here to testify in opposition to the bail provisions that are included in this bill. Those bail provisions can be found in Article 2, Sections 34 to 40 of the bill. And our primary concern is that we believe this is a woefully inadequate replacement to the current consent order that's been in place in policing the industry since 2016. That, that consent order was a very important part of kind of bringing the, the, the bail industry up to the standards that we all expect. It ferreted out bad actors. It ferreted out bad behavior on the part of, of the bail industry. Um, it was the Department of Commerce has done an admirable job of policing um, the industry under the purview of that consent decree. Um, currently, I don't know of any um, bail company in Minnesota that is um, not operating within the, the restrictions on the consent decree. Um, so I really think that in large part, this is a, a, a provision that is a solution looking for a problem, or a solution looking for a problem. Um, I think the legislature and this committee in particular should also be very skeptical of a provision that comes forward that's only supported by a single member of an industry. And that's what you have here in front of you today. 
you have a bail regulation that is supported by the largest bail company in Minnesota. The rest of the industry participants, the rest of the bail companies, do not support this regulation. They're more than happy to continue to work under the consent decree that's been in place in 2016 and been um, very well regulated by the Department of Commerce. Um, and I know that the intent of this language is to codify the consent decree. And I think Senator Latz is very right about that. There probably is a time and a place in order for the consent decree to be vacated and to move to a statutory regulation that covers the entire industry. There's probably real value in that. What you have in front of you does not do that. What you have in front of you is an inadequate replacement to the consent decree. And what you have in front of you is a, is a provision that hasn't been thoroughly vetted enough will provide ambiguity for participants, the bad actors that were ferreted out by the 2016 court order to come back into the marketplace and do abusive practices in the industry. So I come here speaking for a majority of the bail industry here in Minnesota, and we are not supportive of going down this road with the bill that is in front of you. Our members did look at this legislation very closely. Um, we've worked with some of the, the advocates of this legislation. We provided voluminous edits, red lines, and amendments um, to improve the bill, to tighten up the definitions, to try to eliminate some of the ambiguity in the statute that bad actors could take advantage of. None of those edits and red lines are represented in the bill in front of us. Um, even with those, I would say even with those recommendations that we made, we're not convinced the work product is ready to be implemented. I would suggest, respectfully suggest, that there should be a, a very deliberative and collaborative undertaking with the Department of Commerce. They should be at the center of this um, discussion about how to codify the consent decree. They were not at the at discussion. This was an industry-led effort, really an industry-led effort by a sole member of the industry. And so I would really recommend that um, the Department of Commerce, the industry stakeholders, get together in the interim and try to hash this out. Because if you don't get this right, there are bad consequences for the industry. There's bad consequences for the public. And we do not want to go back to the pre-2016 era where there was abuses in the industry. And so that's, that's why we are, at, at this time, opposing um, Article 2, subdivisions, sections 34 to 40. Um, that's all I have to say, Madam Chair, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ines. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this is my bill. This is the first that I have heard from Mr. Ines that there are any issues with regard to this bill. Um, and uh, um, I'd be curious, maybe not to take up a ton of time right now, to find out what these voluminous issues are that are surfacing at this moment um, in the process. Um, my understanding was that up until about a week ago, uh, the industry was all together in supporting the bill that was introduced. Uh, so um, just in the last couple of days have I been informed that some disagreements have surfaced. It's a little late in the process for those yeah. disagreements to surface. Um, and I know there have been some suggestions that were accepted by the Department of Commerce and by uh, the, the other part of the industry that's got a separate uh, representative. Uh, so I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, there's a problem here. Uh, with the proposed language that's in this bill. Uh, I'm always willing to sit down and talk and learn more about that. Um, but uh, there, there is a problem if this continues to be delayed because theoretically any new entrant into the bail bond business would not be subject to the consent decree and would not be subject to any of the restrictions on their conduct that is in there. Uh, which could lead to an unlevel playing field, an unfair advantage to a new entrant, um, which I also think uh, is, is not good and also then could be subject to some of the violations, the egregious behavior that was more frequent in the industry uh, that may or may not have violated any law or statute, but that was um, not healthy for consumers. Uh, so I would ask that the provisions in this bill today remain in the bill 
if we have any additional fine tweaking to do, I'm happy to sit down with the parties. Um, and uh, I also suspect this bill is going to end up in a conference committee at some point. So uh, we all know the process here. Conference committees, things get rewritten, redrafted um, as well in an open public process. So I'm happy to engage in that, but I'd hate to see this stall here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Ines. Yeah, Madam Chair, just real quickly, thank you, Senator Latz. Um, and you're right, you're absolutely right. We were making a good faith effort to work with the parties to try to come to uh, an agreement on this on this legislation. Um, to give you a little bit of context, Senator, we have, um, there's been, last four years, there's been a, a bill presented, brought forward, that was meant to codify the consent decree. Um, those bills were far, far more expansive than the consent decree. They did things that we, th I think, were meant to fence people out of the industry, to make it more difficult for small players in the industry to operate. So we've, we've always pushed back on those, and those never came to fruition and never moved forward, right? This year, there was a concerted effort by Mr. Bagnoli and others to winnow down it so it truly was a bill that would represent a codification of the consent decree. And so we, we committed to working with them to say, okay, this looks like a, a serious endeavor. We want to work with you on it. We did provide, we spent hours and hours going over the legislation, Senator, and we did provide them a number of edits that are not currently represented in this draft. Um, so we are committed, but I also would say that we need a referee at the table. Um, that referee is probably the Department of Commerce um, because there are interpretation differences even within our own membership of what the consent decree covers, what kind of solicitation, what kind of collateral. It's a very complex industry with a lot of moving parts. So um, that referee has not been us. We've been unable to referee ourselves, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, so I take you up on your offer, Senator Last. We'd like to continue to work on this and try to reach something that protects the public and our also gets to a point where we have a statutory regulatory framework that covers the entire industry. That's our goal. All right, thank you, Mr. Ines. Our final testifier is Kyle Macarios. Please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Kyle Macarios, and I'm here uh, representing Teamsters Joint Council 32. As you all know, uh, our members deliver the beer, wine, and spirits to liquor stores and bars uh, throughout this great state. I'm here to testify and express our strong opposition to the wine transfer section of this bill in Article 4, Section 3. I'd first like to express my appreciation to Chair Klein and to Senator Rasmussen uh, for reaching out to us and to other stakeholders and attempting to put guardrails on this legislation to alleviate our concerns. Uh, those efforts were made in good faith, and they are appreciated. But this provision is a significant step in the wrong direction for liquor policy and will do a big favor to the largest corporate retailer in the country, Total Wine. Uh, what's worse is that this favor will come at the expense of all of the rest of us in the liquor industry. It is opposed by the Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association, uh, by the uh, Minnesota Municipal Beverage Association, by the wholesalers, and by the Teamsters. This provision will allow one huge chain to be even more aggressive with their bulk purchasing power, and to take advantage of deals that winemakers offer. These are the buy 10 cases, get one free type of offer. And then move uh, those products among their stores. They'll be, able, they'll be allowed to move up to 36,000 bottles of wine per year uh, among their 10 Minnesota stores. It's a huge advantage that they hold over your, your local, local liquor stores today, but this provision, provision will make it even worse. When Total Wine is offering the same bottle of wine for $4 cheaper than your local liquor store can offer it, uh, this provision will be one of the reasons. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this provision is a step toward corporate consolidation in our liquor industry. It's a giveaway to the largest corporate retail entity in the state, and it will hurt the local liquor stores in your districts. It's a step toward the erosion of the three-tier system that protects our thousands of small businesses in this industry and the great middle-class jobs that our members have move, uh, warehousing and moving the product to them. This provision is a bad idea, and the Teamsters strongly encourage you to remove it from this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ricarios. Mr. Cl uh, Senator Klein. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you to the testifiers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a series of amendments which I think will just sort of correct the bill and will be non-controversial, and I'd like to start by offering uh, the A3 amendment. 
Senator Klein offers the A3 amendment, which I believe is in our packets. Senator Klein, to your amendment. Yeah, Madam Chair, when uh, the provision for uh, Litchfield liquor was presented by Senator Lang, he wanted to add in the city of Watkins, which would match up with language in the other body, and this amendment simply accomplishes that purpose. Uh, the committee attempted to do this during committee time, and it just wasn't quite able to be done, so I'm doing it here. Any questions from our members? All those in favor of the A3 amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed say aye. no. Motion passes and the amendment is adopted. Senator Klein. Madam Chair, I offer the A10 amendment. Senator Klein offers the A10 amendment, which is also in your packets. Senator Klein, to your amendment. Chair, when we heard the uh, Gustafson bill on imitative vape products in committee, we removed the section on remedies uh, and criminal penalties. Um, this was not transferred over to the language of the omnibus in front of you, and so I'm simply doing that here to mimic what we did in committee. Thank you, Senator Klein. Any questions from our members? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A-10 amendment say aye. Aye. Any opposed aye. say no. Motion carries and the amendment is adopted. Senator Klein. Madam Chair, I offer the A-11 amendment. Senator Klein offers the A-11 amendment. Senator Klein, to your amendment. Madam Chair, this reflects work that was done after our committee and the Committee on Judiciary. Uh, this is on the private uh, student loan uh, bill brought to us by Senator Umu Verbaten. I can quickly walk through the provisions in the amendment. Um, this clarifies that federal and state entities are exempt from the definite lender as the reporting and registration language is only intended to apply to private lenders and not capture federal servicers. Um, Section 3 changes the reporting to annual report and changes date from January 1, 31, 2025 to March 15, 2025. Section 3 also adds that the Commissioner of Commerce shall share data collected under Subdivision 10 with the Commissioner of Higher Education. The amendment replaces the commissioner requires by rule with as determined by the commissioner. Section 5 changes the language to read for the, from the original student loan servicer or is authorized under the student loan contract, including any benefits, etc., deleting the words without limitations. Section 6 deletes the words offered by the student loan servicer. Section 6 deletes the word incorrectly. And section 11 changes the language to read to remain on hold during an individual call for more than two hours unless the student loan servicer returns the borrower's phone call within 24 hours of the two hours expiring. A student loan servicer must not allow a call on hold to automatically lapse or end upon reaching a duration of two hours to satisfy this requirement. These were concerns that were raised by members of our committee uh, during committee time and were addressed in subsequent committee stops. Thank you, Senator Klein. Any questions from our members? Madam Chair. Yep. Senator Howe. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, question for Senator Klein. Uh, how many of our, our state agencies meet this requirement? Senator for Klein. For the phone calls meeting that, uh, the callback time frame. Senator Klein. Uh, Senator, Madam Chair, Senator Hall, that's a great question. I'd be interested in that answer myself. I do not know the answer. Senator Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Klein, that's, that's my concern. We're, we're throwing requirements out there on businesses that I don't believe that our state agencies comply with today. In fact, I know they don't because I've tried to get an answer from certain departments. So that's my only concern is, you know, if we're laying that out there for the, our, our businesses to comply with, we should require that of our own agencies and set the example. And that, that's my only concern. Senator Klein. Madam Chair, Senator Howell, let's author that bill together next year. Makes sense to me. Uh, I think the presentation of the bill in committee um, by Senator Umu Verbaten represented that this technique of sort of not answering phone calls or leaving people on hold indefinitely 
was a proven technique of the industry to sort of defer complaints, and so she felt it was an important part of the bill to have included. Any other questions or comments from our, our members? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A11 amendment say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed say no. Motion carries and the A11 is adopted. Do we have Senator Klein? Yeah, my last one, Madam Chair, us, uh, the A12. I offer the A12. Senator Klein offers the A12 amendment. Senator Klein, to your amendment. Members will remember that when we heard the uh, Senator Mann bill in committee about uh, limitations on sales of aerosol dusters, there were concerns raised by Senator Latz and others uh, about the volume that could be obtained in retail settings. Uh, and that work was, again, subsequently done in other committees, the Judiciary Committee, uh, to clarify those concerns. Um, this is the aerosol duster amendment. It clarifies that a retailer is prohibited from selling aerosol dusters containing DFE through same-day pickup services or same-day delivery services. It provides that local ordinances may establish that office wholesalers can sell more than three cans of aerosol dusters containing DFE to a business they have a contract with. It changes the bill's effective date to May 31, 2025. It requires manufacturers of aerosol dusters to clearly warn against the dangers of intentionally misusing duster aerosol products and it has additional warning labeling requirements for aerosol dusters. Thank you, Senator Klein. And staff has passed out the A12 amendment that we are talking about. Any questions or comments from our members? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A12 amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries and the A12 is adopted. All right, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move the A5 amendment, and I'm happy to describe. Staff will distribute the A5 amendment. Senator Rasmussen, tell us about your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A5 would remove the Didmica opt-out within the bill currently. I think this bill um, has an admirable goal of trying to uh, make sure that we don't have predatory loans with predatory interest rates in the state of Minnesota. However, I'm concerned that, as written, uh, that this bill would also prohibit uh, some good financial services from taking place. One example that has been brought to me is you could have a Minnesota consumer who has credit card debt that um, is maybe paying a 36% interest rate or higher looking to consolidate the credit card debt and to get a lower interest rate and under this bill, if they were able to uh, find a financial institution that offered a 25% interest rate to consolidate that credit card debt at 36%, they would be unable to do so because it would be in excess of the 21.75% cap that is in this bill. Um, so I think that this is an issue that we should study in, in the interim, and I'm committed and have been working with colleagues on uh, putting together language that would, would re require the Department of Commerce to come back with some more information and report um, for us to fully consider the implications of opting out of DIMICA. I think it's important for members to know that currently 49 states are in DIMICA, and the seven that initially opted out after this law was passed, six have since opted in. And while there are other states considering this, I, I think it's important for us to take a measured approach, make sure we have the information we need uh, before making this jump. And so I would ask for member support, and you have my commitment to continue working. And I had a good conversation yesterday with Senator Gustafson on this, to continue working with Senator Gustafson and members of this committee to make sure that we do limit predatory loans in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Chair and Senator Rasmussen. Yes, this was an attempt uh, by Senator Gustafson and myself to expand on the work for predatory lending that we did last session. Uh, but Senator Rasmussen has made a convincing case uh, to me and others um, that in our uh, broad sweep of the, this uh, bill, we may capture uh, lenders who are trying to assist uh, Minnesotans uh, with specific loan requirements. I think there is a way to expand uh, our prohibitions on predatory lending uh, that is more tailored, and Senator Rasmussen has committed to working to accomplish that, if not this session, then next session. Uh, and I would ask for members to support uh, the A5. 
Any other questions or comments from our members on the A5? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A5 amendment, say aye. 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 Any, aye. any opposed, say no. Motion carries and the A5 is adopted. Senator Wickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would like to offer the A13 amendment. Senator Wickland offers the A13 amendment. I believe that's in our packets. Yes. Senator Wickland, to your amendment. Um, Madam Chair, I, I'm offering this amendment. Um, yesterday when we had the discussion about Senate File 1037, um, I felt that the, the bill, that there were a lot of questions about the bill and the amendment that was um, amended onto it. And I felt I expressed that I thought there more dis more discussion was needed about the language to make it um, make sure that I understood the full implications of the language. Um, and in doing some further thought about what the bill encompasses, which is basically discussing um, mandates and um, how they affect health care costs, um, I really think that this um, sh bill should be heard in the HHS committee. And so I, um, I'm requesting that we remove it from this omnibus bills and, um, and allow me to have the conversation uh, about mandates and the relationship to healthcare costs and what um, tools we might want to have to address mandates or, or um, extending coverages um, in the HHS committee. Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair and Senator Wickland. Uh, yes, uh, members, uh, the uh, policy surrounding uh, health care plan mandates really is the joint jurisdiction of the HHS uh, and Commerce Committees, and, and Senator Wickland certainly has prerogative to uh, consider provisions such as this further in her committee before we adopt them in an omnibus. Uh, I will also say that I think we share the goal uh, of trying to create some barriers or breaks around just unlimited mandates, the, the risk that those pose to the health insurance market. And she is committed to hearing uh, this provision in um, the Health and Human Services Committee, working with the Chamber of Commerce and with the uh, Minnesota Association of Health Plans to refine the language. And I accept that commitment, and I would ask uh, members to support the A13. Senator Friends. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Wickland. Thank you, Senator Klein. I also think it's appropriate, given the uh, um, Chair Wickland wants to hear the bill in her committee, that we do this. I think we um, have a lot to gain by allowing chairs to exercise their discretion in what they do and do not want to hear. I share, as everybody in this planet knows, Chair Klein's concern about um, costs, and I look forward to having the discussion and being a part of it going forward. With that, um, I'll be voting yes on the amendment. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do appreciate the uh, commitment from Senator Wickland, uh, Senator Frentz, and Senator Klein to continue working on this proposal. I, I think this is one of the most important proposals in the Commerce Omnibus Bill uh, before the committee today because I hear from Minnesotans, whether they're small business owners uh, or employees, about the increasing cost of health care. And I think this is the one thing that I can see in this bill today that would actually help address the cost of health care. As this legislature considers new mandates, um, we need to make sure that we're taking into account the cost of those mandates to everyday Minnesotans, uh, to our small businesses across the state. Um, I think there can be a good faith effort to uh, take feedback and clean up the language to make sure that we have a robust process. Um, but I would ask that members keep keep this bill uh, in the omnibus today um, and oppose the A13. Uh, we can continue to work on this as it, it uh, goes towards the floor. Um, and this language is completely within uh, commerce statutes and within uh, insurance purview. Senator Wickland. I'll just reiterate that um, the Health and Human Services Committee is hearing and take does have responsibility for um, aspects of the mandate, um, mandate proposals, and um, many of them, or all of them that we heard in this committee were referred to my committee, and we had a hearing on, on them in my committee. Um, this provision, or this bill, 
um, needs to be heard in my committee as well. The language is not um, as precise as it needs to be and needs to be more discussion about what the impact would be um, of the language. So I'm not comfortable leaving the um, language in the omnibus until that time. Any other questions or comments from our members on the A13? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the A13 amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. 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 The motion prevails and the A13 is adopted. Senator Dames. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the A2 amendment. Senator Dames offers the A2 amendment, which is in our packet. Senator Dames, to your amendment. The A2 amendment is an amendment that's uh, the results of uh, the work that was done with the Township Mutuals and the uh, Department of Commerce to come up to some correct or some solutions on some of the questions that were had when we presented the bill for, uh, for this uh, back yeah, about two weeks ago. So what the A2 amendment does, first of all, it replies to section three and four, pages two through four of the uh, omnibus bill. And what this does is we originally requested 40 counties and we ended up uh, agreeing at 30 counties that the mutuals could operate in. We also wanted to change the language as far as the terminations. When township mergers happen, if they get out of the a number of counties that they can serve in, they have to, they have to uh, uh, stop the, uh, they have to uh, stop the pay, stop the policies that are without that that jurisdiction. Currently, that has to be done. Those policies have to be canceled, effective the date of the emergency, or t the merger. What this policy does is this uh, says that they can go till the renewal, and then they would need to be canceled at that point. Also, there was some language added uh, if the mer for a merger in a county that exceeds a merger in a company that exceeds the 20 counties, they need to do some following reporting on a quarterly basis with an income statement, a balance sheet. <coughs> insurance and forest and a number of policies. This was agreed to by both the Farmers Mutual Organizations and the Department of Commerce. So this is the results, this uh, amendment is the results of what was done after we heard it in committee. So I would ask for a yes vote in support on this. Senator Klein. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Dames, I, I was anticipating a different amendment that was described differently to me. This is, as I understand it, just an alteration on that 40-county bill that we passed of yours that uh, was brought to us by Farmers Insurance. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and uh, you're representing to me, Senator Dames and Chair, I won't bring them forward, but that the Department of Commerce is okay with these provisions? That is correct. Senator Klein. Members all accept this as a friendly amendment. Okay, Senator Klein accepts the A2 as a friendly amendment. All those in favor of the A2 say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Aye. Motion carries and the amendment is adopted. Any other amendments? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A7 amendment. Senator Rasmussen moves the A7 amendment, which will be distributed by staff. Senator Rasmussen, tell us about your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This would uh, impact a bill that Senator Frentz uh, presented to this committee about uh, hotels and especially smaller boutique hotels being able to have a liquor license. And there was a conversation both from testifiers and uh, the regulatory agency we're supportive of moving that limit from what is in, currently in the bill, which is at 20 hotel rooms, down to 15 hotel rooms. It seems like there's uh, support uh, from Hospitality Minnesota um, and from the regulator to make this move and would hopefully avoid a boutique hotel with 16 or 17 rooms having to come to the legislature and ask us to move down that number again. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Ms. Senator Rasmussen, as always, for bringing your amendments to me ahead of time, and uh, I support the amendment. Right. Any further discussion from our members? All those in favor of the A7 amendment, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, say no. 
The motion passes and the A7 is adopted. Any other am uh, amendments? Senator Dames. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I have the A4 amendment. Senator Dames offers the A4 amendment, which will be distributed by staff. Senator Dames, can you describe your amendment? Yes, I will. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, currently, insurance agents who wish to secure insurance in the surplus line markets because it is not available in Minnesota insurance companies, uh, they must show that the insurance is unavailable and demonstrate proof of the coverage has been denied. This hurdle serves as a disincentive to help policy holders find surplus line coverages, and sometimes it's pretty hard to find that coverage. And so what this amendment does is simply removes the requirement to allow agents to go directly to the surplus lines market when coverage is unattainable from a Minnesota admitted carrier. This amendment is supported by the Surplus Lines Association of Minnesota, the Insurance Federation of Minnesota, Minnesota Independent Agents, Minnesota Association of Farm Mules, Mutuals, and the amendment has the blessings of the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Senator Dames. Uh, my only concern with the amendment, I'm not going to oppose it, but um, I was, you know, uh, scrupulous during pre pre uh, approaching this bill that every provision entailed therein was heard in our committee and members had a chance to consider it before moving it on. Uh, this would be uh, outside that scope. Um, nevertheless, it's been presented to me as a uh, amendment that is accepted by the insurance industry uh, and the Department of Commerce and has no opponents, uh, so I'll accept it as a friendly amendment. Any further discussion on the A4? All those in favor of adopting the A4 say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed say no. Motion carries and the A4 is adopted. Any other amendments? Seeing none, Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Chair and members, for considering the Commerce Department Policy Omnibus Bill this year, and I ask for uh, your support to move it on to the general orders. The question is on the motion of Senator Wickland that Senate File 4097 as Madam amended. Chair, be, excuse are me. you going to open up for any further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Any further discussion on Senate File 4097 as amended? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. There is one provision in the bill that I'd like to just take a minute to speak about, and that is a provision that allows uh, warehousing of the, of the wine. Uh, this directly flies in the face of the three-tier liquor process that we have. And uh, I know that uh, the way it's presented, that it's to help folks that have uh, inventory that are having problems moving and stuff and due to certain circumstances, they would like to have that ability. But that's the start of the, de the erosion of the three-tier system to where we will now have warehousing and warehousing will provide better pricing for the people that have the warehousing and it will put uh, a lot of pressure on the non-warehousing folks and it does fly in the face of the 302 system. So it's in the bill. I hope that we could get it taken out, but uh, I just wanted to talk about the concerns I have with it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further comments before we vote on the bill? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to um, you, you know, thank members of this committee and Senator Klein, I think, for good, robust discussion on the different provisions that are included in, in this bill. Uh, while it's, it's different than the bill that I would put together, um, I think there's a lot of good bipartisan work that's included. Um, I did want to just talk briefly about the wine transfer uh, bill that is included in the omnibus and um, we've tried to address any and all concerns that this could uh, allow or lead to warehousing. Um, the maximum that any uh, liquor uh, location would be able to transfer would be at most four times a year with a limit of only 75 cases. And so I, I haven't seen any evidence that that would allow um, warehousing at any level. Um, and it has support from smaller liquor stores like the city of Fergus Falls, which just has two locations to be able to move a uh, stranded inventory. Um, I support the three tier system. Um, all of the wine still has to be uh, sold and delivered by uh, wholesalers and Minnesota Teamsters, um, but I think this is a common sense reform that will allow uh, some stranded inventory to be moved around and to get to the consumers um, 
uh, the, the right product at the right place at the right time. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Klein, for um, all the discussions on the bill before us. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Not to um, delay the adjournment of the committee hearing at all, but I just want to go on record as saying I would oppose that particular provision. I think the warehousing uh, provision runs counter to the basic letter and spirit of our three-tier system and um, wanted to make sure that that was clear. Having said that, uh, very proud to be a member of the committee to see the work on the omnibus bill go forward and looking forward to voting yes on the omnibus bill at this stage. Any other comments from our members? Senator Klein, any closing comments? All right, then the question is on the motion of Senator Wicklin that Senate file 4097 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. No. The motion prevails and the bill is on its way. Thank you very much. Oh, no further business before the committee. The Commerce Committee is adjourned. <laughs>